Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this episode of the Truffle Tales podcast, where it's my job to tease out stories that inspire, educate, and entertain you from the truffle hunters, mushroom experts, and enthusiasts of the world to help deepen your connection with Mother Nature and the wonderful world of truffles and fungi. And on today's episode, we have a, an amazing guest. His name is Gareth Renaldon. Despite being a photographer, writer, magazine editor, and publisher over the last 25 years, he has turned himself now into a truffle grower. Born and raised in the UK, Gareth now lives in New Zealand on his farm, Limestone Hills, based in the Waipara, if I pronounce that correctly, Waipara Valley near Christchurch on the South Island. His truffle farm is unique in that they are the only farm in New Zealand to produce four different species of truffle. His award-winning book on truffles, The Truffle Book, is a perfect introduction into the pleasurable and mysterious world of truffles. He's a truffle grower because he likes eating them, and perhaps he'll explain why. You can learn more about Gareth by visiting limestonehills.co.nz, and also please follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Grenau. That's at G-R-E-N-O-W. Gareth, welcome to the show. Good morning or good evening. Very excited to have you. Good, good evening for me, and uh, I think it's a good morning for you. Um, yeah, as absolutely. Come to us from New Zealand. So I just wanted to 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 kick off, really, probably from somewhere slightly unexpected, because in my in the research, when I was sort of learning about yourself and uh, and digging into your story and background, uh, there's one thing that uh, you exposed me to that I've never never even knew about, uh, and I thought you could just kick us off and tell us what this is. What is a a wordle? <laughs> <laughs> a wordle. Is that a how word. I even said that right? Oh uh, yeah. Well, word, yeah, wordle word. is a it's um, it's a uh, it's been quite a sort of hot topic over the last uh, couple of months. It was a it's a word quiz, a sort of a, a mind game, a word game that was written by a guy in New York for his girlfriend, and he published it on the, the web sort of late last year. And um, a group of people in New Zealand, twi the Twitterati in New Zealand. Um, happened on this thing and came up with a way of um, sharing it on social media. And um, it became a huge, I mean, global hit. And uh, recently, in the last few weeks, the New York Times paid um, Josh, um, the guy who wrote it, over a over million dollars for the rights to add it to their puzzle page. So oh, wow. it's just, it's a bit, it's a bit like starting, it's a bit, it's a bit like Mastermind, the, the, the old mathematics game where you've got yeah. these coloured pegs that told you which numbers won't work. Only we do, it's done with five letter words. And uh, the last two days I've done it in, in two each day, which is a, a remarkable feat for an old man like me. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, nice one. Well, yeah, I need to, uh, I need to get digging into that because it, um, it sounds really interesting. Um, also, I've got to keep my brain firing. I don't do much of that sort of stuff, but um, awesome. Um, so how did you get into foraging in the first place? Oh, um, probably because when um, when I was a wee lad, my mum and dad occasionally would go out and, and you know pick blackberries and, and and collect mushrooms from the from the fields. And so I you know I sort of knew a little bit about it. They weren't they weren't obsessive about it, but they did enjoy the trips out to the countryside and, and, and producing those sorts of things. And you know, in a way that's going back to the, the 1950s and early 60s, their roots were in the 1920s and 1930s, and the, you know, my grandmother's roots were, were, were before that. So kind of reaching back into, into history to, to do that. It was a traditional thing for a, for a lot of um, the people who, who perhaps didn't have the money to go and buy jam from the, from the shop every week. So yeah, and then um, a long time later, in the in the late eighties, um, early nineties, I began to work for myself, and I became very um, enthusiastic about wild mushrooms. Um, the story is that I I met and married a New Zealand girl in in London, and when when we got married, I soon discovered that if I wanted to be anything other than takeaways, I'd have to do the cooking myself. So <laughs> she bought me a book, and the, the the first cookbook that she bought me was an introduction to Italian cook, an introduction to Italian cooking by Antonio Carluccio. Now Carluccio is famous for his love yeah. of mushrooms, and this book, every time he mentions mushrooms, he says how wonderful it is to have wild ones. So um, as 
we, we had children, as the kids were starting to grow up, we would go out into the woods around southwest London, which was actually Antonio's stamping ground. Um, and I taught myself to, to find mushrooms. So my dad to um, Isha Common was one of my favorite places. Yeah. Um, I'm thick Camille, my wife thought I was trying to poison everybody, but you know, we are all still here. But I am entirely self-taught. Um, but I have a, a very strict rule, and that is that if you're in any doubt at all about uh, what you've got in your bag, then you throw it out. Don't mm. eat it. If you cannot 100% positively identify it, don't eat it. Um, the fact is, too, that most of the really, um, really good and tasty uh, mushrooms are, are pretty much unmistakable. I mean, porcini are porcini and chanterelles are chanterelles and, and hydenum repandum or, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're all pretty much unique. There, there are some basic rules you have hydenum to follow. Hydenum repandum, is that hedgehog? What, test, That's the hedgehog, it? yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. I have to be a bit careful because the names that I use are the Latin names from about 25, 30 years ago. And yeah, they keep really things keep have changed, haven't they? Things. Um, but yes, I, I used to I got to the point where um in the early 90s, if I if I wanted mushrooms for dinner, I had a range of places that I could go and pretty much hundred percent guarantee to to have mushrooms for dinner. My biggest mistake was to go out into Isha Common in one of in one of the plantation parts of that. I saw what looked like a field of porcini. I mean, they were absolutely beautiful mushrooms, far more than I could collect. Yeah. I filled a couple of, of bags full with these things and took them home, and I was I was as pleased as punch. Uh, turned out that they were a, a bolete uh, that looks very similar to uh, Boletus edulis, but yeah. they were the bitter bolete. Oh. The pillars for layers or whatever, and um, yeah, so completely inedible. So yeah. That was didn't take you long to find out taste wise that that was the wrong <laughs> one, eh? No, just a just a quick um, a quick snip of a, a taste, and oh no, that's no good, because you can ruin a dish by getting one of them wrong in there. But yeah, so that got me going on foraging, and in a way that kind of led to truffles as well, because Carduccio loved his truffles, and in fact, uh, uh, before we we moved to New Zealand in 1996. Um, uh, it seemed a, a good thing to do at the time. And uh, before, in the sort of couple of years before uh, we went, I had a sort of madcap publishing idea, which was that we should do. Uh, I had a very, a very good designer friend of mine called Tony Cohen, and Tony and I had done a number of projects for major publishers and, and um, sold some magazine ideas. And he and I thought that it would be cool to do a kind of foraging and mushroom magazine. And it turned out that Tony knew Roger Phillips. Now, any um, UK forager will be familiar with Roger Phillips' absolutely masterful uh, photographic guide to the, the mushrooms of, of Britain and Europe. Um, so I got to meet Roger, which was fantastic. Wow. And um, also got to meet Carluccio in his restaurant, talking to him about, you know, the, the business of foraging and, and everything else so that was that was really cool was was that meeting um, at the the same time or did that happen at different times yeah, how, how did at the same you, time okay how did we, you get we, to meet Carluccio oh, I basically rang him up okay <laughs> I just rang him up and at his restaurant in uh, well what was then his restaurant the the Neil Street restaurant um and Antonio uh, was a lovely guy. I mean, he was just genuinely into mushrooms. He just had this wonderful warmth about him and willingness to share and wanting to be helpful. Um, so we had, you know, I met Antonio and then, of course, we moved to New Zealand. So I, when I came to New Zealand, I thought I was actually giving up anything to do with, um, with foraging and mushrooms and so on. I had absolutely no idea I'd end up growing truffles. But the, the the Porcini story continues, <laughs> and it's it's a, actually quite fascinating that Christchurch turns out to be one of the very few places in the Southern Hemisphere um, where port, where you can find Porcini. Um, mm -hmm. And in the course, so this story is getting a bit more convoluted, and I am going to write a book about it at some point. But um, around about the end of 1996, I saw a real estate, uh, so estate agents guide to properties in, in, in Christchurch. And there was one place and it said with 450 truffle oaks and a little light bulb went off. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Can you grow truffles here? 
And that set me off on a, doing a bit of research, and it led me to a scientist called Dr. Ian Hall. Now, Ian had been the, the guy who had introduced truffles basically to the Southern Hemisphere. It was his pioneering work that, that, that began truffle production in New Zealand. And as a result of that, kicked off the, the truffle growing that's happening in Australia, in Chile, in Argentina, and in, and in South Africa. So I met Ian. And we hit it off. We got on very, very well. Ian gave me some good bits of advice and fed my obsession. But he had just mentioned, did you know Porcini grow in Christchurch? And I said, what? You, yeah. Oh, right. OK. So end of January 1997, the tail end of a tropical cyclone blew across the South Island, dropped about two or three inches of rain on Christchurch. And being a good mushroom hunter, I knew that, you know, seven days or so afterwards would be a good time to go looking for mushrooms. And I'm not joking, I walked out into the middle of Hagley Park and there were poor genie everywhere. Now, the beautiful thing was that very few people in Christchurch knew they were there or appreciated that they were edible. They just kind of assumed these things were. What sort of, what sort of uh, environment is Hadley Park? Is it like quite near an urban, the, the urban oh, it's area? The, it's the equivalent of Hyde Park. I mean, it's oh, right really? in the middle of the city. It's a CB, wow. central city uh, park. Um, and it was established by the settlers in the sort of 1850s and 1860s and planted out with oak trees, um, and a whole variety of, of European trees. It has a fantastic uh, botanic gardens in the middle of it, lakes and a golf course and sports grounds. Um, the um, cricket arena, uh, which you'll see for the Women's World Cup coming up quite soon in March, um, that's in Hagley Park too. So it's, it's mm -hmm. a real kind of green lung for the, for the garden city, which is what people call Christchurch. But I walked down into North Hagley Park and there were porcini everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. I have never had so much success at, at collecting porcini in my life. In, in Isha Common, you had to go out there and kind of you had to get there before the poles and before the yeah. Italian, you know. You had to be able to dive under gorse bushes, to, you know, where somebody had missed them, you know. This was just, I couldn't believe how easy it was. And we, we filled carrier bags and carrier bags and carrier bags with these things and dried them and ate them and had a lot of fun. Um, it's a great deal more difficult now because everybody and his wife knows that there were Porcini in in, um, in Hagley Park and around Christchurch. And in fact, they've, they've spread around the country because the, um, the, the reason that there is Porcini or there are Porcini in Christchurch is that uh, one of the very early settlers was a wealthy guy called Sahedon Rhodes. And he um, wanted to recreate the gardens of his, of his home in, in England and, and shipped trees from his, his garden out. Now, in those days, they didn't, um, you know, they couldn't fly them. They had to go on a boat. So they brought these things um, as, as, as kind of sticks with roots on and soil wrapped in sacks. And you had to mm. sort of keep them moist for the, for the long journey. And he um, basically established a, a nursery with these trees, used the trees to plant out around his, um, his homestead, which is called Otahuna. Um, it's now a very upmarket um, hotel um, with a superb chef who loves picking his own porcini uh, and loves truffles too, thankfully. Um, but the main nursery was then used to plant out the, um, the Hagley Park and various other parks in, in Christchurch. Um, and so on the roots of these trees from England arrived Porcini and a, and a couple of other things. Um, and so where, wherever the, the, those trees were planted, you find the same things that you found um, in, in, in the UK. And it turns out that the, 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 the Porcini then became established in a Ministry of Works nursery. And the trees from that were then sent out around the South Island for all sorts of projects in the um, 40s, 50s and so on, when they were building the big dams um, down south um, in the 60s and 70s. That Basically, Porcini have kind of naturalised themselves in the South Island, and they, there's not by, a lot of... By, just by, a happy, by happy accident, yeah. the, which is... Yeah, wow, absolutely. Amazing. And um, there's... The, the kind of native um, fungi in New Zealand are not really terribly well known. Um, they they were collected and some of them were eaten by the original Maori 
um, settlers here. Um, but there's an awful lot that we don't know about uh, New Zealand's native fungi, but a lot did arrive with the European settlers, with the British settlers. So one of the things which is relatively uncommon in, in Britain, but very common here, is the giant puffball, um, mm. which, you know, it's not that difficult to find here. And you can sometimes find fields with lots of them growing. Um, and, you know, it, in our little farm here, apart from the truffles that we grow, I saw yesterday we've got shaggy parasols growing, which are looking delicious and might well have them for dinner. Uh, we've got uh, nice. fairy ring champignon, um, nice. Marasmus soriades, and uh, we've also got, this is a deliberate introduction, we've got some saffron milk caps. Uh, when I said that Ian was feeding my obsession, he kept, get, you know, pointing these things that uh, you, you might be able to grow, Gareth, do you want to have a garden? So, <laughs> yeah, I did, read about, I did read about this. You're, you've you've in, included um, growing out as a, I don't know, a test run, some saffron milk caps. And I, I checked yep. out Ian's website as well. He's uh, it's quite all over his website that um, he can do that. Um, just, yeah, just, just, one, just one of the things that I think has been a question that, has been going around in my mind over the last few weeks and you just raised reminded me of it then with the you know the spread of porcini by you know planting and having a nursery of trees which were inoculated with the with the mycelium um is there a way whereby you know a someone like me could find porcini and is there something we can do to help spread porcini in this country you know so is, is there like a technique that's like a you know a, a slapdash or a, a little hack you know that isn't necessarily going and growing your own nursery of trees um is there anything that we could do because i know how people like take off the caps if they're mature and just just throw them um you know that's one technique i'm guessing that is probably better than doing nothing but i just wondered if there's anything that you have come across that is something that we can do so that you know hopefully in the years where we come back to that spot there might be more yeah. porcini, or we could take them to new woodlands, for example. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally what you're trying to do is to encourage the, the fungus to find new homes. And if you're, as you say, if you're setting up a plantation, you want to start with trees that have been inoculated with the fungus that you want to grow. Uh, porcini, um, that has been done for porcini, um, but it's not terribly reliable. Um, it's not as well established as, as um, truffle growing is, for instance. Mm. Um, people have been working on it for some time um, because, you know, they're, they're important commercial species. Uh, they're traded, why, you know, it's a global trade in Porcini, global trade in Chanterelle. Um, those Chanterelle have kind of been done in the lab, but it turns out to be really difficult to grow them in the wild. Um, there have been experiments in Europe with... Um, trying to improve the production of mushrooms by adding spores back into the into the ground. Um, and one of the ways that this has been done has been to basically rip the ground with, with uh, agricultural machinery. So what you're doing is breaking the roots. Um, and then as the new, you put spores in the ground, water them in, and then as the new roots grow, they'll encounter the spores hopefully and set up a, a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, but that's pretty hit and miss. I mean, it does work, but you've got to have a lot of spores and you've got to have agricultural machinery yeah. and everything else. I think for for the for the average forager, if you if you want to play around at it, um, the, the the bit of the the mushroom that you really want to use is the sponge underneath. That's where the spores are coming from. Um, mm. So if you've got any mushrooms that are, are past it, you know, it's not uncommon in the UK to find. Of porcini that have been virtually hollowed out by all the insects and so on uh, anything yep. like that crumble them up if you've got a, a, a place that you want to experiment with maybe loosen the soil or, or dig, uh, dig some slots and water the spores into those slots and, and just see what happens it's easy as, you know you want to be sure you're in the right kind of habitat for that fungus yeah so you know you you look for the for the marker species so if you're finding uh, Amanita muscaria, um, it, that likes the same sort of conditions as, yeah, as yeah. porcini. So if you find some Amanita, um, then maybe that's a good place to introduce some porcini and see how you get on. Um, but, you know, it's pretty hit and miss, but give it a go. What, what are you going to do, eat the rotten ones? 
I'm not sure really. No, I've, <laughs> I've, 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 uh, I've had a very, well, I've had a hard learning curve. I, I was in the New Forest one year and uh, came across, well, I spent a whole day there with a couple of friends and we managed to fill two big, you know, shopping bag fulls worth because we didn't have blooming anything else more decent to carry them in yeah. of porcini. And uh, yeah. I not having not having had that many big finds before, I didn't realize the importance of processing them quickly and um, or relatively quickly to, after, you know, the day you pick them, because as you've just mentioned, porcini are loved by, you know, the maggots and God knows what else. Yeah. And and when you pick them, they don't just suddenly free themselves of all these maggots. They're all pretty much still in a lot of the mushrooms. And so I, I, I took maybe 36 or even 48 hours before I, you know, decided, right, I'm going to go and empty these, you know, and start processing them, drying them, et cetera, et cetera. I only had a small dryer. So I, was, I think I was just dreading the, the, the task, to be honest. And lo yeah. and behold, I went and looked in the bag. In fact, before I got to that stage, um, Danny had started, my, my partner Danny had started saying, what's that smell? <laughs> That's a horrible smell, and literally yeah. they had started rotting quite badly in just that short window of time, and I I couldn't really rescue any of them. So um, I'm not sure how many kilos that was, but by far my biggest find, and um, I didn't eat any of them, so that was a bit sad. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, no. no. Uh, sorry, the, I was, you mentioned the new forest, and I know that yeah. um, mushroom uh, foraging in the new forest has been controversial. Uh, mainly because of the big commercial uh, people who go in and hoover up everything that's there. Yeah, what's but, your thoughts um, on that? Uh, I wish they wouldn't do it. Um, I used to... I, Foraging I or making that, it controversial? Oh, no, the um, the commercial groups. Uh, oh, right, yes. Big yes, yes. I mean, it, yeah. I used to turn up at the car park in Isha Common and if the, if the thing was full of cars, I knew that there were pickers out there and it was just no 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 use even thinking yeah. about it because they would absolutely hoover everything up. No, I don't mention the New Forest mainly because it's such a great place to go looking for mushrooms. Um, and I, I didn't go there a huge number of times, but I became quite good at finding all sorts of things there. <laughs> and I suppose I may have been a little bit ahead of the curve because I was working as a, a magazine publishing consultant and I, <laughs> I used to take uh, every year a group of my clients down to the New Forest and we'd go mushroom hunting oh, wow. um, and have a slap up lunch at the pub there. Um, so, yeah, I've got some fond memories of, of the New Forest. <laughs> it's lovely. It's lovely. I, I used to go there every year as a kid camping. So I've got all those nostalgic memories as well. And then more recently, I've been dragging my friends on camping trips to, to basically <laughs> go mushroom foraging with them. Um, but yeah. yeah, I found some found some very amazing mushrooms. I, I found a type of um, hedgehog mushroom, which I've not seen in any of the books that I have. So it's uh, quite peculiar. But the thing I struggle with is fighting that balance when you're out on a, a a foray and you know part of you wants to stop and check every mushroom especially the ones you don't know and then the other part of you is you know maybe balancing you know going on a walk with your partner and the dog and how, how, do, you, how do you stop and uh, I don't know if you've uh, ever had that um, problem. Well, or... We had a, we had a really good uh, setup in the in the early 90s with we had young children and um, one of the things that persuaded my wife that um, yeah, I knew what I was talking about. We were walking through Isha Common with uh, friends of ours, um, and the um, Jenny, the the friend, her um, mother was Austrian, so she was really clued into uh, wild mushrooms and and collecting them in the woods and so on. And we were walking through Isha Common. I said, "Look, here's a chanterelle," and she said, "Wow, that's great. Let's have a bag full." And so we trained the children, there were four kids, we trained them to go dashing off into the trees and the shrubbery and, and finding chanterelle. So that was very effective because it meant you yeah. didn't have to hurt your back. You had a yeah. you had a sort of seven-year-old who could do all the sort of crawling through the things and, of course, thought it was a great adventure. So, um, yeah, that was very effective. Brilliant. And just coming back to your introduction, um, can you just take us back to the the, 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 the part of your story where you bought a truffle farm in New Zealand and 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 how that came about and then and then what was the next phase before you know you were able to harvest your own truffles okay so I mentioned that we moved to New Zealand in 96 and um, 
we were uh, we'd sold our house in London, so we were pretty pretty much committed to, um, to to New Zealand. And we were living with my wife's parents in Christchurch, which was fine, you know. But it's a bit difficult to move back into your parents' home when you're middle aged and have got kids. Um, and it was my wife was flying around the world for for an American bank, and um, we, we needed to have our own place. So she set me this sort of list of things that I had to achieve. I had to find an old farmhouse. I had to have a big garden, had to have a view. It had to have um, a river or stream or water of some kind. Um, and of course, I'd also seen this ad on the back of the real estate guide for, for truffle trees. So I was talking to Ian Hall about truffles. Ian sent me up to uh, Wipera um, to meet somebody up here who had been was one of the original pioneers of, of truffle growing in New Zealand. And uh, I was talking to them and, and uh, she said, um, did you know that Limestone Hills is going to be for sale very soon, um, 25 acres? And by the way, the, the back paddock is where Ian first wanted to, to plant truffles up here because it's got the perfect soil. So limestone um, is a key ingredient for, for truffle growing. If you look mm. at all the, the truffle regions of Europe, they're all on limestone. The, um, so what we've got here at Limestone Hills is a, it's a small farm. It's only 25 acres, so 10 hectares. And probably only half of that is, is usable land. It's got gullies, it's got river flats that get flooded. Um, but we do have these wonderful natural high pH limestone soils that derive from limestone. It's a very fine black soil with a pH of, <coughs> it varies quite a bit, but from uh, pH of eight to seven and a half, which is mm -hmm. right in the target range for the truffle species. Um, so my wife had sent me this list of things that I had to achieve for any house that we bought. And, and secretly, I think she, um, she thought I'd never find it and that we could sort of be mortgage free forever. Um, didn't work out that, that way because I walked into Limestone Hills. I stood in the front of the house. It's a hundred year old farmhouse. It's got a brilliant view. It's got a big garden and established trees, and um, it's got a 30 meter, 40 meter cliff down to the river below, um, big pond, you know, everything you could possibly want in, in, in Camille's list was there. Um, and it just happened to have the perfect soil for truffles. So we, we made an offer uh, Christmas 96. It took about six months to buy because uh, there were all sorts of um, legal hoops that, about surveys that had to be gone through, but eventually in the middle of 97, um, it became ours. And um, I planted my first truffle trees in August 97. Um, that was uh, uh, trees um, inoculated with tuber melanosporum, the, the perigord black truffle. Mm -hmm. So we planted those in 97, and we got our first truffles in 2000. And, uh, six I think so it was nine years after planting and we were told originally Ian told us it could be anywhere from five to 15 years and we did it in nine so we thought we'd done quite well um, and at the it's sort of having done that initial truth year there, there was then other land that we 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 had to do things with so we planted a um, an olive grove so we've got 250 odd olive trees that um, occasionally produce exceptionally good oil i mean I, you'd expect me to say that but yes <laughs> the oil is wonderful um and then there was a another paddock between the main truffier and the house and um i thought well what 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 else likes limestone and one of the things is obviously great um the the the, the, the home of pinot noir um mm. is burgundy and all the top vineyards there are growing on what they call the Coke door. So this is a limestone slope um, from the from the hills down into the valley. Um, and we, we don't have a, a Coke door here, but we do have a paddock which has got this wonderful limestone soil. And um, so we planted some Pinot Noir and we planted some Syrah and uh, we've made some really delicious uh, wine. Um, I thought I was going to be doing it as a hobby, um, turned into much more than that. But now I lease that out to a winemaker and let him have all the stress and strain. Because let me tell you, if you if you ever want a, a peaceful retirement, don't plant a vineyard. It is a huge amount of work in one of those things. And then we went on from there. Um, 
around the turn of the millennium, sort of 2000, 2001, Ian's team at um, the, the science organization had been working on other truffle species. And he introduced two new species to New Zealand. One of them, uh, Tuba borki, um, which is known as the Bianchetto or mm. the white truffle. It's the only white truffle, uh, it's the closest thing that we can grow to the very expensive Italian white truffle, Tuba magnatum. Um, it has it's it's good enough when it's at its best for uh, the less scrupulous uh, amongst truffle traders to pass it off as magnatum. So Ian, in, you know, fed my obsession, and I planted some of the first trees in New Zealand, inoculated with with uh, the Bianchetto. And at so the same is that, time, is, that, is the flavour profile similar to the uh, magnatum? Would you say yeah, at its best? It, it, it's at, when it's at its best, it's kind of garlic and parmesan and quite a, a strong um uh, it, it 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 doesn't have the sort of amazing um intensity of of magnatum i've had some magnatum meals where honestly as soon as they open the door to the kitchen you can smell the truffle because it's sort of coming towards you um <laughs> You probably won't get that with Bianchetto, but if you're a chef working in the Italian tradition and you want to work with fresh truffles, it's an extremely good um, alternative to magnatum. Never going to be the same. I wouldn't like to pretend for a moment that it is, but it, it is it is really good as a truffle. Um, you have to be you have to know what you're doing, so you have to learn about the uh, when they're at their best, and you have you know grading them is something that comes with with experience and time. Um, you learn about how the um, flavor profile and aroma profiles change over the season. So they start off being quite aggressively chemically, and then as the ripeness increases, they become much richer, perhaps less intense, but much richer and more complex in, in aroma and flavor. Um, yes. Yeah, so I had my little plantation of only, just, I think, 23 trees originally of, of Bianchetto. Um, and then we had a little plantation of uh, tuber estivum, um, or tuber, also known as tuber uncinatum. Um, so that's the burgundy or summer truffle. And I call it the, the burgundy truffle because um, it's <laughs> better for marketing. Um, yeah. But, yeah, so that little truffle... Uh, we planted in we planted both of those patches of trees in 2000 and 2001 and in 2012 we got our first truffles from both of those little blocks and that really wow. did change our um, kind of business because Melanosporum we produced in 2006 and we've produced it every year since but not really in huge quantities and that's probably because I'm not very good as a grower um, I've probably stuffed it up too many times to to, to get the sort of huge commercial yields that are necessary if I'm going to have the retirement I aspire to. What's like a rough, um, I've got no idea, like in terms of the acreage for the <clears throat> for the perigord, uh, how many trees get you how much on your, you know, on an average year in, in weight? Well, you, know, you have to do it in terms of the area rather than numbers of trees because okay. obviously you can't guarantee yeah. that there's going to be truffles in every corner unless you're very lucky um but you know 20 to 50 kilos per hectare wow. so a hectare is two and a half acres it's um, enough to get excited about isn't it Blimey. oh yeah i mean it's, yeah. it's it, it is because um our selling price in new zealand until recently was three thousand dollars a kilo wow um that's fallen a bit recently partly because of covid but also yeah. because of competition from australia but um yeah, so it's in terms of an agricultural product. I mean, one of the reasons why there's been an explosion in 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 truffle planting um, in in Britain is that actually the returns are pretty damn good. Um, with the Bianchetto, I sell for three thousand dollars a kilo. We don't get that many kilos because it's quite a small um, plantation. Um, and the Burgundy truffle, I sell for a thousand dollars a kilo. But, and, and oh, yeah, here we are. Here's something I prepared. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in this one hand. Here, yeah. So 
this is a, a burgundy try. I have to tell you, my, my nose is just kind of twitching at the moment because these two little truffles here, they're probably the last two really good ones of our summer season. Okay. Um, so you're coming a, to the end. You're coming to the end of the season over there for yeah, the burgundy. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we've had an incredibly wet um, summer. And February here, we've had a record-breaking amount of rain. And, you know, my records go back 25 years now. So the the ones that have been ripening um, recently have been ripening straight to rot. So I took Rosie the Beagle out yesterday. We found nearly a kilo of truffle, um, all of it, um, apart from a couple. Um, oh, too rotten to, best. Oh. to be able to sell. So, yeah, um, they won't be wasted because they will be sold to a nursery to produce new trees. So, you know, mm. to be an oculum for new trees. So there won't be a waste, but um, it's, yeah. So that's interesting. Sad when that happens. It's not, not that I have any intention of, uh, you know, foraging for truffles for sort of commercial reasons, because I, I don't see myself going into that. But um, obviously for personal reasons and consumption reasons, definitely. But basically what you said there is um, there may still be a use if you find truffles which are, you know, rotting or past their best. You know, someone might, um, you know, if, if I had a, uh, uh, a a friend, which I don't at the moment, but if I knew somebody who so their business was to inoculate truffle trees and sell them on, they would probably say yes if I had a handful of these rotten uh, truffles. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just shove them in the freezer um, and then find a good home for them at some point. Um, this is basically what, what I do. Anything that I can't sell goes into the freezer. And as long as it's ripe, you, unripe truffles are not much good for inoculating trees. The, the spores actually have to have gone through a ripening process. Yeah. So um, as long as they're ripe and uh, unsaleable for other reasons, like rot, um, stick them in the freezer. And, oh. you know, you know, you may you you know we were talking about um, porcini and how you might increase production in an area or introduce it to a new area. Try it with the truffles. Why not? Um, Tuberus stevum, um, the summer or burgundy truffle, is a native to Britain um, and is occasionally really prolific. Yeah. Um, and so the reason why there's been an explosion in 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 the collection of of truffles and and sale of truffles. From the from you know regional UK is precisely because you can find occasionally find lots. Now let me tell you something about the the truffle my little truffle plantation. I mentioned it's about thirteen trees, <laughs> and it's a total surface area of probably one hundred and twenty square meters, so not huge. You know, um, a small country village hall maybe. So would that be like a, a tennis court, a squash court, or? Oh, about half a tennis court, probably. Okay, cool. I'm with you. Yeah, and 13 trees. Those trees are getting on for 20 years old now, so they're quite big. Um, that little block of, of trees produces regularly 10 to 12 kilos of wow. truffles. Um, now, obviously, it depends on the season. Um, usually, the truffles are quite robust, and we can manage to sell most of them. Um, this year's different. Um, we've already, mind you, we have already harvested nine and a half kilos since Christmas. So this is wow. now. If you think about agricultural returns, if you <laughs> this is a call it 100 square meters producing 10 kilos of truffle. That's and say half of them are good. That's five thousand dollars from 100 square meters. We can scale that up to the hectare level. It makes um, almost all other forms of agriculture look like a waste of time. Hmm. So I'm obviously planting more trees because I would like to see this repeated. But um, there's this, this, <laughs> this some interesting stories about my little block of, of, of burgundy trees. The first is that the, um, I have, the trees arrived in two batches. So the first batch of trees were inoculated with um, truffles that came from burgundy in France. Um, and... I thought that was great. That was very appropriate. And the uh, scientist in France, one of the um, kind of the the the, the, the um, I'm trying to think of the right name for him. He's a, he's a Bonapartist. So he, but you know, he's a sort of the Napoleon of, of truffles, Gérard Chevalier. I have a photograph of Gérard. He's retired now, but I, I have a photograph of him holding an oak tree, a little baby oak that's only just been planted. So that's quite fun. Um, and then 18 months later, Ian 
produced a second batch of trees. And this was produced with um, inoculum that came from the island of Gotland. Now, uh, Gotland is in the um, Baltic and um, Burgundy truffles were found there in the late, probably late 90s. And it's since become uh, one of the reasons to go to Gotland is to go to the truffle festival in, in November. It's become a real tourist thing and the, the, the truffle industry, the trees have been planted and it's really taken off. And a, a, a really, um, okay, yeah, she's good. She is a friend of ours. Christina Vidane is the scientist who basically got all this going. She's kind of the Swedish Ian Ball, if you like, only a great deal prettier, prettier than Ian, I have to say. <laughs> um, but so the second batch of trees arrived with inoculum from Gotland and trees sat away and growing them, and, you know, thing, time passed, 12 years, um, 10 years, 12 years. And when we started finding our first burgundy truffles, Rosie the Beagle was also finding white truffles around the outside. And I was talking to the, Ian had left the, the, the science organisation by then, so I was talking to the, the chief scientist there about these whitish truffles. And I thought they were probably a weed species because we do get a weed truffle called tuba maculatum. Um, it turns up in our... What, what do you mean by a weed species? As in like just a, a pest or one that's not for eating? And, I mean, you can eat it, um, but it's not the tastiest. And right. if it gets mixed up with Bianchetta, one of the reasons why um, tuba borki um, doesn't command a high price in, in Europe is that because there are lots of little white truffles, you can find them in, in Britain, different kinds with different flavours, some of them not good, some of them good. Um, and it's really difficult to tell them apart. Um, okay. And you, you know, if you, if you didn't, re if you really didn't know what you were doing, you could be confusing tuba maculatum for tuba borki, and as a consequence, really bringing the, the value of both down. So maculatum has a very chemically um, hospital kind of disinfectant edge to its nose. Um, the, the, the flesh looks different, the skin looks slightly different, but it, you have to know what you're doing to be able to tell them apart. Mm. And anyway, I was finding these whitish truffles around the outside of the, the, the summer truffle block, and I thought they were maculatum. I didn't even think twice about it. And then um, the, um, the scientist involved, uh, Alexei Guerin, um, said, Gareth, send me one. Let me have a look at it. So I sent it off to him. Um, and he sort of emailed me back. He said, Gareth, I think you've got um, Bianchetto. And it turns out that what happened was that um, Bianchetto, tuba borki, is very aggressive in nurseries. And they've been producing the first Bianchetto trees alongside the first um, burgundy truffle trees. And they've been a cross infection. Um, and it, it turns out this is not something unique to, um, it wasn't sloppy in the nursery it was just something that happens and it's actually happened in several nurseries around the world so now if you're producing both sets of trees you've got to go you've got to be very careful that you don't get this um, this cross infection going on so what i had was um the the the, the truffle trees that have been inoculated with the swedish truffle had, had that's what we were finding. We were finding the, the Swedish truffles in the middle of our block. And then around the outside, we were finding good quantities of, of tuba borki. And that's because they have, they have different habitats they like. So the Bianchetto likes a, um, a sunny open woodland. So it was growing around the edges. Hmm. Um, Stephen or summer or burgundy truffle likes a shady, moist environment. So in the middle of our block where there was lots of shade and where the, um, the, 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 the irrigation water wasn't sort of immediately evaporating, um, where the good sort of levels of soil moisture, that's where we got all the truffles. So it was um, as a result of this, um, I, I, we eventually were, um, we were actually invited to go to Gotland to the um, the Gotland Truffle Festival to talk to some of the Swedish um, growers and, and truffle industry people about this little piece of Gotland that um, was was turning up in New Zealand. And um, it, I've actually seen the place where the uh, truffles that were, were that were used in New Zealand. I've seen the, the the back garden actually where they were harvested. So I've, I've visited the um, Swedish roots of these New Zealand truffles. 
scientifically too, all of this stuff, I have to say, I did warn you that it'd be difficult to stop me talking. So no, it's brilliant. I love it. <laughs> let me let me tell you that um one of the things I really love about all of this, and I've become, as you probably gather, reasonably obsessive about it, but the science of it is fascinating. Yeah. Um and so we've learned a lot, you know, when we started out in when we when the business started in New Zealand, let alone when I started out, it was pretty mysterious. We we did you know, when you grow apples, you can kind of look at the tree and see how the apples are getting on. When you grow truffles, it's a bit difficult. You know, you can't just dig everything up because that kind of ruins the ruins the, the, the process. But the whole business of the relationship between fungi and trees um, is 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 fascinating in and of itself. So the, the mycorrhiza, the, the symbiotic relationship which is actually a three-way symbiosis because you've got the tree, you've got the truffle growing on the roots of the tree, and then you've got the animals that eat the truffle. So it's a three-way mm-hmm. symbiosis. Um, and they're all required. Um, so there's very good evidence that truffle spores will germinate better. This is reasonably recent pa- uh, papers on this. The spores will germinate better if they've passed through the gut of an animal. Wow. Um, and so... Uh, one of the things that nurseries would probably be quite interested in doing um, is trying to trying to mimic that process, perhaps, mm. <clears throat> to improve the hit rate in their nurseries. Um, but one of the things that um, I mentioned that it was called the Burgundy Truffle from France, and it was also called the Summer Truffle. So <clears throat> the French, the Burgundians, tend to look down on truffles gathered anywhere else particularly the ones that ripen in summer, um, because they say, oh, the only really good ones are the ones that ripen in autumn and early winter and that come from Burgundy in France, and that's why we charge a premium for them. Um, Unfortunately for the French, it turns out that now that we can um, do, you know, analyse genomes, it turns out that the genome of the autumn-fruiting Burgundian truffle um, is identical to the summer fruiting one, summer truffle. And what's happening is that the, the truffle is simply responding to the environment that it finds itself in. And so in parts of Spain, for instance, um, they have summer truffles where it's warm and they have the autumn fruiting Burgundian truffles in cooler places. Um, and we have, I have an absolutely stone-cold demonstration of this because the back garden in Gotland, where my truffles originally came from, um, it's, a, it's a sort of October, November, December truffle. It comes before the first frosts. There are no truffles in summer. Nothing ripens in summer at all. And it's a cold area. You know, we're talking about the middle of the Baltic here. It's, this is not, you know, Benidorm. This is, mm. um, this is cold. And... Um, the came to New Zealand, and, and I think one of the reasons why I didn't actually find the truffles until 2012, I think they were probably there for a few years before that, is that the I expected them to be autumn fruiting. And I simply wasn't looking when they were ripening. It turns out that this autumn fruiting genome from, from um, the Baltic, when you transplant it to a relatively warm part of New Zealand, turns into a summer truffle wow. and it's a good and strong and you know there's there's from a from a from a sort of culinary perspective it is every bit as good as the autumn ones in fact if anything it's even stronger i mean the uh, the aroma from these things if i didn't have the lid on this um it would be filling this room with 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 aroma it's a really penetrating and powerful thing so in, in the uk um you know, we know where the, the truffles occur naturally. It's on the chalk soils of, of the downs of Hampshire and Wiltshire and, and, and right the way around the, the southwest of England and following that big arc of limestone up through the, through, through the centre. And it's been found as far north as Scotland. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's a widely distributed natural um, home in, in, in the UK. There are probably cooler parts where, where it fruits later. And so when you were talking to James last week, um, James likes to harvest later because that's when the truffles have more value. But for, when I went out, I 
I was lucky enough last time I was in the UK pre-COVID to to go out with James and and, and harvest some truffles with her, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, this and, this must be uh, the part of the podcast which you said you um you couldn't listen to the end of because he said that um he was sort of. Uh, tongue in tooth or tongue in cheek he was saying that uh, you know you found the biggest truffle of the day on that on that day and he, <laughs> yes. he was a bit gutted yeah, absolutely. um yeah so i mean it's interesting <laughs> go off on a slight tangent um yeah back in the early 90s um being a writer and a, a magazine publisher and so on like like all journalists um you know you think you've got books in you you want to write books and i was working for myself so i had you know I could, I could, I had more time to myself. And I had a few ideas for, for, for sort of, I was going to write a thriller and it was going to make millions, you know. I've, yeah. Ever since the Beatles wrote Paperback Writer, I thought that's that's my role to, to, to fame and wealth. Um, but, yeah, so I, I, I came up with this idea because I was into the foraging, so I thought I would write a book. And I, I wrote the first four chapters, actually. It was going to be a comedy called um, The Last Truffle Hunter in England. <laughs> okay. And at that and at that time, the, you know, apart from the occasional press reports of of truffles turning up in someone's back garden or whatever, there was no systematic harvesting of of truffles in Britain. I um, I won't repeat the um, the stories that James told um, in your last podcast, but basically, at that time, um, I could posit the last truffle hunter in Britain um, as as a reasonably comic thing. That you know you could write a book about, and there was—I was—he was going to have all sorts of comic adventures um, in his truffle hunting, including being locked up by the police and all sorts of things going, meeting drug smugglers, you know, all, all that sort of thing. But um, it turns out now, having having been out of the UK for twenty-five years, actually, the place is heaving with truffle hunters. Mm. You know, <laughs> there there are truffle foragers everywhere. Um, there are people harvesting commercially, like James and. Uh, that I think it's fantastic because this is a, an industry that died in the sort of 30s and 40s, but it was a it was a big industry in its day. Um, Queen Victoria used to get um, British truffles sent to her by the uh, harvesters in Hampshire uh, on an annual basis. So, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm really pleased that it's all come back together. I'm just a bit sad that I never finished the book because I can't write a book now about the last truffle hunter in Britain because there are far too many of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Um, just going back to one of the things you said a few minutes ago because it, it sort of sp sparked my uh, curiosity. Um, your anecdotal evidence of your Burgundy truffle basically adapting to your environment and therefore fruiting at a different time of the year because of the warmer climate. Yeah. Does that speak to, um, and I don't know, I'm sure you know a lot more than I do on this subject, but does that, does that speak to, you know, what's happening with global warming and um, are we going to see more and more truffles appearing in the UK by a result of the warmer climate or is it going to be, we're just going to find more truffles because there's going to be more people actually looking for them. Um, I just wonder, and and also the Perigord Black as well, because I got excited until until James actually corrected me last week that you know that was a truffle that could be found, um, you know, in the north, the, the the British wild, uh, not a plantation. But um, I, I think I stood corrected. And and would that change as a result of environmental changes? So. Um... The last period of, of, of global warming and, uh, um, is the, was the end of the Ice Age. So the, the whole of um, northwestern Europe and the whole of the UK was covered by ice. And if you, if you think about it, the, um, the truffle trees obviously couldn't be growing in the middle of an ice field. So the, 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 the tree, the forests kind of retreated south into kind of refuges. Um, refuges where they where they survived the ice age and then when the ice melted the the forests moved north and I suspect that Tuberistevum the the summer or burgundy truffle was one of the colonizing the first colonizers so very adaptable to different um, climates um, and so as the ice sheets retreated the, the Stephen moved further north now Melanosporum needs a warmer climate um, and so it, 
it wouldn't move north until the climate had warmed up enough for it. So you'd get these phases of different fungi move following the ice sheets as they retreated. So with current global warming, the areas that are currently producing uh, Melanosporum, which needs a certain minimum amount of heat, are getting too hot. They're, they're drying up, and, and the, the French and Spanish are, are very concerned about this. Mm. Um, at the same time, Melanosporum is actually being produced in plantations in the UK, never been found in the wild before because mm. um, you know it, it, it never got there uh, during the um, the end of the ice age. It didn't get far enough north. There was there was a channel in the way, um, and the um, so it's been produced in Wales. It's been produced in Sandringham. Um, so, the, you know, the uh, Prince Philip had a, a bit of success there. Um, oh wow! I didn't know that. So yeah, the, so the, it's it's been produced in the UK. Um, the, the the it's a the commercial producer is is in is in South Wales, and you can follow him on on Instagram. I yeah, you can you can put that in the show notes because yeah, <laughs> uh, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, so I'm very pleased that this French truffle is now a Welsh product. So that's very good. Um, so yes, uh, with the with the summer or burgundy truffle, because it's such an adaptable fungus, you can see it as a as something helping to colonise new forests or forests as they move north at the end of the ice age. And yes, it will it will move further north as global warming progresses. Here, the the biggest issue with the current rate of climate change is that it's simply going too fast. Um, mm. The warming at the end of the last ice age was relatively slow. It was of the order of kind of one degree Celsius in a thousand years or 10,000 years. It was not quick, whereas we're, 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 we're getting two or three degrees in a hundred years. And the natural mechanisms of adaptation um, simply won't cope with that. Mm. So if you want to be able to grow truffles in a hundred years time, you might have to start thinking about planting a long way north now and waiting for the climate to get warm enough or, or hoping. It's something the, the wine industry has been doing for some time um, in Spain and uh, particularly in Spain, actually, they've been looking at moving the, the, the vineyards uphill to cooler areas. Uh, the same is happening in Italy and Australia is moving to Tasmania and so on. Your book's amazing, by the way, and I've really oh, enjoyed okay. reading it. And um, I wanted to, you know, there's so there's so many things in there and so we could obviously dive deep on many different things but um going back to Anto Antonio Carliccio I mean he's written the foreword which I thought was amazing uh, but it, the picture is sh showing that he came he came and visited Limestone Hills that's that's pretty awesome yeah. and cooked you a cooked you a meal by all looks of it from the photo oh well he fried it yeah the, that story is um again it was around about um the, the turn of the millennium um, oh, hello, Antonio Kat. was one of the, uh, he was the kind of the, the, the main guest at a, a foodie weekend in Christchurch. And I was going to be one of the presenters there talking about truffles. And when I, you know, they, they basically at the end of this weekend, they were going to have a day for all the, um, all the guests to come up and do wine tasting and, and, you know, meet some local producers and so on. So I volunteered Limestone Hills for that, um, knowing that and that meant that Antonio could come up. And, oh, brilliant. No, it was great. I was able to, to sit, stand in my kitchen and basically blame Antonio for everything because it's, you know, all his bloody fault. <laughs> if, yeah. if, if I hadn't, you know, married a New Zealander who bought me his book, I wouldn't have become a mushroom uh, forager. I wouldn't have started growing truffles. I wouldn't have come up, become obsessed with food. So it's all his fault. Yeah. And um, yeah, for a few years there, um, he was really, really influential in my life. And he was such a nice guy. I mean, you mm. talk to anyone who, who met Antonio at any time. He's just such a lovely, genuine bloke. And I'm sure if you, you I'm sure that came through and was one of the reasons why he was a, a success with his TV programs. Yeah. And um, with, you know, he did that two, uh, two chefs thing with, with, with Gennaro Contaldo. Yeah, I love that um, program. Brilliant. Yeah. And, you know, he's just such a nice bloke. It was, it was, it was really good to be able to, to get him here. And he was kind enough to, 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 to write the intro 
to the book, as you said, and I was able to meet him at his restaurant in London, give him a, a copy and all the rest of it, which was which was fantastic. Um, the 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 porcini that he's cooking in my kitchen there were actually collected by Ian Hall because um, Ian came up for that day as well and. As soon as Antonio saw, they'd actually found a couple of huge ones. As soon as Antonio saw them, he basically sat down at the kitchen table and started prepping them <laughs> <laughs> for this collection of, of chefs from around the world, from, from Chef Anis in, in California and from Melbourne and, and so on. Um, we're all sort of watching what he was doing. It was, it was hilarious. I have to tell you, too, that he had... Some he, he could tell some of the most filthy jokes you could ever oh, possibly yeah. imagine. And not um, sure if I should ask you for an example, but no, no, I'm not going <laughs> to no. give you an example. Don't worry, because no. you, you certainly get banned from Spotify if I told yeah. you these. <laughs> um, no, but he sat for a while. Um, good friend of mine um, is a winemaker called Danny Schuster, and Danny was very, very helpful when we were establishing the vineyard here at Limestone Hills. He was. Um, he was basically the guy who made the first really good South Island Pinot Noirs in New Zealand in the in the 80s. So, but Danny's a lovely guy. Danny also has uh, an outrageous sense of humour, and there was um, so the, he was sitting at a table um, out on our deck, chatting to Antonio, um, both smoking Marlborough. So you know, <laughs> and. The jokes they were telling each other were so filthy. Ian Hall came out, stood, <laughs> stood by the table, heard the jokes, and then he sort of acted as a guard and sort of shepherded all the ladies away from this table <laughs> so they wouldn't hear what was going on. So, and I love, just basically, a lovely, lovely guy and um, a sad loss, I have to say. Oh, hello, someone just popped in. No, that's um, all right. That's, what was I going to say? Was that what? what what was the uh, what was the meal he cooked up for you then? I'm, I'm guessing simple or did oh, something he just fancy. Did, he just um, fried off the the porcini and we had those with some, with some toast. It was a very very simple thing. We we it, it wasn't a, you know it wasn't a full on meal. No, he yeah. was just having. He just thought these porcini should not be ignored. They should be cooked. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, out of all the research and the places you went and the people you spoke to um, for your book, uh, the truffle book. What were some of the things that stood out in your sort of memory when you look back on it now, which are, you know, super exciting, inspiring or remarkable or interesting in some way? Well, it's very difficult because, I, I mean, I've been in this business for 25 years and for the last 15, we've been actually producing troubles. And for the last 10, um, you know, we've been, we've been um, producing three or four different kinds of truffles actually it's more I can actually take the dog out at certain times of year and find five or six different species but um that's is that on your own property actually. or are you go, yeah, do yeah, you yeah. go out okay oh, do you go out other places truffle. outside of your own property and can you find truffles that oh we do we, we there, there are no wild truffles in New Zealand okay. or if there are then we don't know about them um no, I, the, Rosie the Beagle and I go out and do away gigs um, for friends of ours locally who've got truffle trees. Okay. Um, they're often wineries and, you know, the dog's wages get paid in bottles of very fine wine. So that's that's always a plus. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in all the... In all the in all of the time that I've been involved with truffles, I think the, the thing that's um, struck me has been that the... You know, there's a, there's an awful talk about and a lot of talk about the the the, um, the mystery of growing truffles and how people will never tell you anything, how how secretive they can be. Mm. And I'm certain that that's certainly there is an element of that, and there is all sorts of skullduggery. I mean, there's the stories of dogs being stolen and, and you know um, truffle people being shot and people putting landmines around their troopiers. It's all true. I mean, that sort of stuff does go on, but overwhelmingly in 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 all of the all of the people that i've met over the years and certainly all of the scientists truffle scientists that i've met from around the world always always the nicest people keen to share keen to talk um maybe there's a sort of camaraderie in being obsessed about these strange underground things you know if you if you find somebody who shares that obsession then you're good you know, you kind of 
latch onto them and you want to talk there. So we've we've got over the years. I, cer- I certainly over- find that with uh, with foraging and mushroom foraging in general. When you meet another, yeah. you know, fungi forager obsessive, it's uh, yes, you're quite happy because it's you know you don't really meet too many of them in the normal in your normal yeah, day no, to day. Right. What I love about it too is that, um, and I, I I usually put this in the context of where we are in New Zealand, which is which is basically a wine region. Um, the, the the relationship between truffles and food and enjoyment and pleasure. My customers are some of New Zealand's best restaurants. Now, if you like eating food, to go into a restaurant where you're you, you're greeted and sat at a good table and they look after you and you know it, that sort of thing is you can't put a value on that. It's just fantastic to be mm. able to be a part of all that and. Yeah, that's, so that's been a lot of fun. But but in all of the research that I've done, it's definitely the people that you meet, that sort of thing is is, is most important. But if you want sort of really memorable things that um, happened, I, what, one story that I put in the in the book, and I've got to remember here, this book was written in yeah. 2000, <laughs> you know, before I'd ever produced any truffles, so it's 2005, and it's whatever... 16, 17 years on now. I hadn't even produced a truffle when when I wrote that book. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna to have to work on another one. But um the there's a story in there about the um, a meal I had in Italy. And that meal will stay with me forever because it was truffles and what they call the fruit of the woods. So it was basically fungi and, and truffle. And when we arrived there, we had to go into the kitchen because it was the scientist who was taking me there. It was his mate's restaurant. So we had to go in and pulled out this box of white truffles and we were allowed to choose the one that we were going to eat. Mm-hmm. And we had um, we had porcini, we had um, orvoli, the Amanita cesarea, you know, the orange, oh, yeah, yeah. they call them in France. Um, we had um, chanterelle. There was, you know, white truffle. There was just everything in this meal. And the um, moment that, that sticks in my mind, I sort of hinted at it earlier when we were talking about tuba magnatum, was that we had the, uh, the magnatum simply as a, a, an omelette, a large omelette shaved with lots and lots of truffle. When the door to the kitchen opened and the waiter came out carrying this, this silver platter with, with omelette and truffle, everybody in the room just like that because the smell was so strong mm. and you know it, it, there are very few moments that, where where food does that where a whole whole you know room of 30 odd people suddenly goes wow focuses on that mm. fantastic you're gonna gonna stay with me forever but I mean, there have been lots of moments like that you know you know when you when we, some of the first truffles we harvested eating those is, is fantastic now we've got four different kinds and they all have their own different flavor profiles and seasons and so on. So they all have their uses um, and we have our favorite dishes for them. So can you, yeah. can you share, oh, this one again to be one of my questions for sure is uh, what's your, what's your favorite way of eating and or preparing and eating truffles? Okay. So one of the most important things to know about truffles is that they, <clears throat> they have a kind of umani effect. So they make things more delicious. Um, and, and what makes them so desirable? So if we think about their relationship with, the, we spoke about the three-way symbiosis before, tree, truffle, and, and, and animal. So basically over hundreds of millions of years of evolution, tens of millions of years of evolution, <clears throat> they've evolved to be incredibly attractive to animals. You know, their whole lifestyle choice is to be eaten by something. To spread the spores, so these the the aromas that they pump out, there are probably a hundred different aroma compounds going on. Some of them produced by the truffle, some of them produced by bacteria that live inside the truffle. So mm-hmm. there's a complexity thing going on. There's a varies with terroir, for instance. Uh, there's definitely a terroir effect going on, um, but the majority of the aroma compounds are fat soluble so you i don't know if you've ever tried any of the sort of truffle alcohols so you can get truffle gins and and, and uh, truffle schnapps and so on 
No, I haven't. They don't really taste a lot like truffles, and that's because alcohol doesn't carry the the the, the key aroma compounds. Incidentally, slight digression: um, truffle oils um, useful only for training dogs. Yeah, um, they've got you know one, two, or three different aroma compounds and yes they are the same compounds that you get in natural natural truffles but they're artificially produced and they have none of the complexity and richness of the the, the wild truffle the naturally ground truffle so because the things are fat soluble the dishes that work really well with truffles are they have to involve fats so they involve butter they involve eggs um, they involve cream they involve cheese um, so, for instance, with um, the Perigord truffle, Tuba melanosporum, the first dish that we have every year with those is a uh, basically what the Provençal call brouillade, so a truffle scrambled eggs, basically. Um, cooked very lightly, so they're still fairly liquid. Mm -hmm. um, eggs should have been stored with the truffles for three to four days, so they get really intensely flavoursome. Um, you can make this without using any truffle, as long as you've truffled the eggs well enough. Um, so uh, make your brew yard, um, eat it with some sourdough and the roughest but good red wine that you can lay your hands on. Um, so for Melanosporum, that's just, we, we, we did a dinner party once um, to local friends here when we first had our truffles. And... I, the centerpiece of the meal was was truffle scrambled eggs. Now, you, you know, this is not really a dinner party dish, is it? But that truffle scrambled eggs is something that people still ask me about now because, you know, 15 years later, they just remember how delicious it was. And, and uh, to me, that the, the simplicity of that dish is an expression of the, of the, of the truffle's potency, if you like. Um, there's a great... Temptation, but you know, if, when I sell my truffles to chefs, and I look at Instagram and see the dishes that they're going in, yeah, they're all great. I'm sure they taste gorgeous and they look brilliant on the on the, on the plate. But how many of them actually really have that kind of depth of flavour that, that you get from prolonged infusion? Mm. Um, so I, I'm always a great fan of simplicity and, and flavour. Um, so with, I said Melanosporum, it's, a, it's the Brouillard. One, with the Burgundy truffle, the thing I like to do uh, most is to truffle a cheese. So buy yourself some really good brie um, or camembert, um, open it like a sandwich, um, shave some truffle in, close it back up, wrap it in cling film, leave it for two or three days, and when you eat it, that cheese would be the most delicious cheese you've ever eaten. You may not think that it's strongly truffly, but it will be, beyond a doubt, the most delicious cheese you've ever eaten. Mm. And that's what I mean about the umami effect going on. And you've given it some time for the aroma compounds to, to dissolve into the, into the flesh. With Bianchetto, I like to do, um, I, I always every year make truffle butter. And this truffle butter doesn't have any Bianchetto in it, but we... Um, cube up some really good butter in foil, um, put it into the sealed container with the um, with with the eggs and the and the bianchetto, and these little cubes of butter will become intensely truffly, and then you just freeze them. You don't have to put any truffle in at all. Commercial truffle butters, which do exist, um, have truffle kind of mixed up in them because it looks better. Yeah. Um, but they're not re you know, it's, it's the infusion that makes the thing delicious, not the presence of the truffle. In fact, the presence of the truffle makes it harder because the, I mentioned before, there's bacteria in these things. And if, you know, and if you pasteurize it, you're getting rid of an awful lot of the flavor. So you, you're, you're giving yourself shelf life problems if you're putting fresh truffle into butter, whereas I can freeze this butter and it'll keep for three or four months and be absolutely delicious if you finish a risotto with it or finish some pasta with it. Um, so you can extend the season that way. Is there anything that you have in the back of your mind that you would like to do with them that's a bit more experimental or, or um, something you haven't tried yet with them that's on your to-do list? Or have you tried everything that's... Because <laughs> when I find I them, I, I just can't wait to experiment, doing all the normal good stuff, but then also... How how else can we use truffles to 
you know, have delicious I tend, experiences. I tend not to do anything complicated, as I yeah. said. Um, that's for my customers to do. It's their yeah. their jobs as restaurateurs, as chefs, to to um, to apply their craft. And I, mm. I don't pretend to be a chef. Um, there are a few things that there's this <laughs> there's one classic French dish called um, poulard en demi dieu, which is famously the the chicken in half morning. So slices of black truffle under the skin, um, chicken stored for a while and then poached and uh, served with the truffle sauce. Um, it's a bit of a faff doing that. I have mm. done that, but um, there is a <laughs> there is a version in Spain where you prepare your um, chicken with all the truffle underneath the, the skin and in the cavity, and then you bury you bury it in in cold ground and leave it for a week, <laughs> and then dig it up and and cook it. Uh, I wouldn't mind trying that sometime. It's just that where we are, it never really gets cold enough to do that without a risk of decomposition. Limestone Hills is sort of roughly equivalent to our climate is roughly equivalent to the south of France or northern Italy. Um, and we don't really get very cold winters and we don't really get very hot summers, but the sun is at least as powerful as Tuscany. So there are some things that we aspire to that we just can't do. <laughs> are you writing anything or have any plans to do any more uh, writing? Yeah, I've I've had, oh God, I've been on this book now for probably about five years. And I always promise my partner that I'm going to finish it next year and that next year, next year and next year and next year. But yeah, <laughs> um, it's 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 a kind of update. It tells a bit more of our story. Uh, it updates. There's a lot of science in that original truffle book. And we have really found out a huge amount more over the last 15 years about the, the biology and, and physiology of truffles. Uh, the truffle genome was done in 2009, Melanosporum. We now got genomes for, for, for most of the species. And that's taught us a lot as growers, let alone as scientists, about how to go about um, producing truffles more effectively. Um, so there's a lot to update. Um, and I've got a working title for the book, which is um, Truffles with Rosie. And uh, Rosie is my, my beagle. And um, I really need to do it before she pegs it. I mean, she's she's twelve now. Don't, forgive yeah, me, yeah. listeners. I'd I'm love to get to see it. Dog. Yeah. Can you? Did you um choose Rosie as a as? Did you choose Rosie as a beagle for specifically for the fact that she was going to hunt truffles, or you just found her and she was a great dog and you've hunt, trained her to hunt no, truffles we, anyway? Rosie is is our third beagle. Um, oh. And uh, we chose beagles um, for two reasons, really. The the first was that uh, my parents had a beagle when I was growing up, so I was familiar with the breed and I, I like yeah. them. They're they're really good family dogs. They love being part of a family, um, and they have the finest nose of all dogs. They've got roughly twice as many um, um, sensory. Um, whatever it is, is in their noses, as, as most other species. Um, a, a beagle, for instance, can detect the equivalent of a teaspoon of sugar in two Olympic swimming pools of water. Mm. So yeah. for Rosie, finding truffles is trivial. She is exceptionally good, isn't she, Andrew, little dog? Ah, she's got a very nice chunky she's head. Exceptionally good. Um, so if you're listening to this in black and white, Rosie is a... Um, an old beagle now. She's um, she's twelve years old, and she's in the twilight of her career. She's not the kind of bouncy beagle she was when we um, started training her. She arrived in um, two thousand and ten, and was finding truffles in two thousand and eleven. Oh, dear. oh. <laughs> but um, she's she's very well known around the district because we go out and harvest, as I said before. At, at other truth years, and yeah. um, she is by um, she is an exceptionally good truffle dog. I'll, I'll, the example I'll give you, sorry, I just let her down. The example I'll give you is that um, when we started producing Bianchetto, one of the commercial um, truffle hunters, because you know there are people who have their own dogs and and, and ply their trade visiting truth years. Um, she wanted to move. She her dog had been trained on Alana Sporum. 
and she wanted to transition the dog into being able to find Bianchetto as well. So she brought the dog. I was happy for her to come up to us and to go through our trees. And the dog did really well. She found, I think, 200 grams of, of, of Bianchetto. Um, so the handler was happy and I thought that was good performance. But so I thought the next day I'd take Rosie out and see that, you know, had the other dog really cleaned out everything that was, was worth harvesting. Rosie went out. We found a further 300 grams in, you know, about 15 minutes. Oh, wow. So Rosie was finding stuff that another dog, another good dog, um, had ignored or hadn't noticed or whatever. So is it hard? Uh, yeah, is it hard for a dog to transition from one truffle species to another if they're only used to finding one to begin with? I, I mean, a lot, I, we trained our original truffle dogs on truffle oil because we didn't yeah. have fresh truffles. Um, you can, I mean, dogs are. You can train them to be almost anything, and and yeah. I do know people who train their dogs to be purely Melanosporum and not to go for anything else because that's all they want to find. And I guess if you're working in, in the, in the wild where there may be, you know, like it could be in, in Hampshire, <clears throat> there could be a dozen, a dozen uh, truffle species in a given woodland. But if the, your target species is, I don't know, Estevam or Bramal or whatever, um, you, you, you want the dog to go to that target species. You don't want to be finding everything that's there. My interest um, is is partly that uh, because I've got different truffles, I need my dog to be able to find everything. But also I need to know what else is there or I like to know what else is there. So if um, Rosie hadn't switched from the Stephen to Bianchetto, I'd never have known that we had them in that block. Um, you know, so for me, the, the with Rosie, the um, I wanted to find everything. Um, so I'm, I encourage her to find everything. I reward her just as much for finding a stinking truffle, um, Melanogaster ambiguous, which we, which is a naturally occurring thing here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I reward her for those, not quite so enthusiastically. You know, don't don't uh, make a fuss of her finding them, but she gets a reward for finding them. So, I mean, uh, from your perspective, and I know you're working with your dog and and, and training. I would suspect you want to concentrate on, you know, estebum and mm. that particular smell and flavour profile, um, just so that the dog knows what the target species is. But you could just as effectively train that dog on porcini. Yeah, I think um, my plan is to get to the stage where I can, I can, you know, train him on. Yeah, as you said, truffles and also porcini or chanterelles or whatever it is that the ones you really want to find, right? Um, a question on that: I have a truffle oil. Obviously, I'm using truffle oil at the moment, but it's it's you know it's I don't even know how old it is. Does that impact the quality of the truffle oil age, and will that affect um, the dog training, or should I so, go and buy a new, a fresh one? Yeah, you know, I'd, probably, artificial. I'd probably buy a fresh one. Buy a fresh um, one. Because once you've opened the lid, they, 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 they're volatiles. So they kind of, they, you know, think the intensity of the oil will mm. diminish over time. And if it's been sitting at the back of a cupboard for a while, yeah, the oil may have gone rancid. Um, yeah. They'll be, you know, may have off flavors or whatever. Now, always best if, if you can, um, I would suggest talking to some of your local friends about mm. getting pieces of truffle that you can use to train the dog with well it's funnily um, enough i in my excitement when we got buddy last year we got him end of january and within the i think yeah within the first week or even before he arrived because you know i've read things about you know take it back to when they're puppy and they're just a few weeks old you know people say rub truffle oil or something around the yeah. teats of the of the mum and obviously i couldn't yes. do that in fact i very very nearly uh sent some truffle oil to the breeder to do that but I, I, I sort of refrained but I did um I did buy uh too much money's worth of truffles to, in the hope that <laughs> I was going to train Buddy from from like you know the first few weeks um and those truffles uh have been in my freezer for over a year now and uh, I was actually going to ask you what 
you know, can I do anything with those truffles now? And I think the answer that you gave earlier was, well, you can potentially inoculate some trees with them, but I don't think much else. Um, but you can probably use those for training. Um, but bear in mind that it's better to do it with fresh truffle because yeah. as long as the truffle is fresh, it's still respiring. It's still giving off the aroma compounds. Once it's been frozen, the it will still have aroma, but it'll only be the aroma that was there when you froze it because you've effectively yeah. killed it. Um, so, and and the 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 what I find is that, for instance, with Bianchetto, actually, um, once it's been frozen, it smells like dried porcini. Um, you know, it 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 doesn't have the same aroma profile as the fresh product. But it's better than nothing. If so, if you've got that as Stephen in the fridge, maybe get some chunks out and and don't make all your training on those chunks. Maybe talk to somebody like James about getting some of his third grade stuff. You know, the stuff that yeah. he can't eat, you know, can't get rid of, um, and using it for dog training. Um, there's no doubt. I mean, as I say, I trained my first dogs with with truffle oil, and they made the transition to to real truffles. Um, very very easily uh, so I'm sure you'll find the same but I'd still you know cancel perfection if you can get hold of the the, the fresh truffle um, better to do that we'll, we'll figure it out we'll figure it out um, you alluded to this earlier but how do you describe the flavor or taste or aroma of truffles and you may, you may want to distinguish between species Oh, absolutely. I mean, the yeah. distinguishing between species is why the species have different species have different price values. tags, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Tuber magnatum, um, as I said, is is I think without doubt the the most intense of the truffles, um, the strongest aroma, um, and it it is sort of garlic and parmesan. It's almost impossible to describe. I think in my mm. book I called it old socks and sex. You know, it's it's those sort of a, a sort of smell of corruption alongside stuff that just makes you want to eat. And I, I said before, it's it, you know they've evolved to be attractive to animals, so it's it's not really surprising that it works so effectively on us. So um, magnatum is probably the the most intense, um, and then you get into um, bianchetto, which is the same sort of flavour profile, but maybe a a little bit less intense. Um, it's got possibly a slightly more chemical edge to the nose, depending on. So the less ripe they are, the more chemical it is. The the riper they are, the more complex. But still in that garlic parmesan um, kind of area, um, works really well um, with pasta dishes in risottos and so on. Um, if you're cooking in the Italian tradition, Bianchetto is a kind of alternative to, to Magnatum, just as effective. And it's wonderful for producing what I call um, the truffle burps. So I don't know if you've ever experienced these, but if you have a, a really good truffle meal, um, the, the truffle um, slices that have that been in the food or on the food um, come down into your stomach and they, they're still giving off aroma. And so you get little eructations, little reminders of mm. that, that truffle flavour. And actually, the, the truffle boats are probably why, um, probably why I got into the business in the first place. Because a long time ago in a uh, southwest London suburb, I went out for lunch with a with a <coughs> editor of a magazine I was writing a column for, and it was um, on the door. There was a little white um, note that said, "We have truffles from Alba." And I thought, well, I'll try these. And the guy bought a bowl of risotto out and shaved about five or six slices of truffle on top. And I thought, wow, that's not very much for the amount of money they're charging for this. I think it was 12 quid for a bowl of, of risotto at the time. Yeah. But I ate it and it was utterly delicious. And we had a nice bottle of wine with it because in those days you were allowed to drink at lunchtime. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I, I had that lunch and I was sort of, yeah, it was good, but possibly not going to be a life changing moment. But I went on tasting little reminders of that truffle, then went on for the afternoon and into the evening. 
And uh, that I was kind of thinking, this is this is amazing. This is incredible. Um, so and only out of the birds. one, or only out of the one orifice, or or both? Uh, no, 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 only out of the one orifice. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. but, yes, <laughs> it doesn't go no, both ways. I, I mean, I mean I, there have been times when I've eaten so much truffle, I have wondered about that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, so the the, the truffle burps and, and the bianchetto is absolutely superb at, at giving you the truffle burps. It, it does have that kind of intensity. Um, if we move from the white truffles into the black truffles, so the black truffles, we've got tuba melanosporum, we've got um, tuba uh, stevum or the burgundy truffle and tuba brumal or the winter black truffle. Um, they all have, if you like, they have a similarity to them. Um, they're, they're more floral um, mm. than, than the garlic and parmesan of the white truffles. Um, the um, Melanosporum, it's, it's forest floor. It's um, kind of violets, that sort of the area of things. It can be, really ripe truffles can be incredibly intense. I mean, intense enough that if you've got one in your pocket, um, the dog will start, you know, start twitching 20 meters away. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't have this, the, the, the lingering aroma. The, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the smell of Christmas lilies, we call them down here, but the, the intense lingering smell that lilies have, the tuberous stevum has that in spades. So I can, if I've, as I was yesterday, washing and grading a pile of truffles um, for maybe you know, half an hour, they're, they're sitting out on the bench top, um, and then they're, they're they're stashed away. I can still smell those truffles two hours later. Mm. So I mean, poor old Rosie's probably kind of choking with the intensity of the aroma. But the the the, the aroma lingers, and it has that lilies have that kind of a lingering aroma. Um, Bramal um, often thought of as a lesser truffle, and certainly doesn't command the high prices, but is widely used um, in in restaurants in France because it's cheaper. Um, it has a kind of musky edge to its nose, which is completely characteristic. You can't mistake it. And it's not as attractive an aroma as Melanosporum or a stevum. But when you cook the truffle, you get all of that truffliness and you lose some of the muskiness. So some of the best truffle restaurants in France actually use Brumal a lot because they can use a lot more because it's a lot cheaper. So all of these truffles have their place. Um, and there's, you know, the basically black truffles are kind of French cuisine and white truffles are Italian. But then you've got so much mixing of cuisines going on now that, um, and you've got different truffles coming into the market. In America, for instance, on the uh, West Coast, in the Douglas fir forests, they've got an amazing range of native truffle species that have incredible flavor profiles that are really, really different to the European. Um, sauce truffles. There's one, um, there's a black truffle that um, tastes like pineapples. It still has that wonderful truffliness, but it, it, it's brilliant in desserts. Um, they, they, you know, it's a whole different ecology over there. So if you want to, to you should talk to somebody um, from, from Oregon. Um, there's a guy called Charles Lefever, who is a scientist um, and a truffle tree producer, and he started the Oregon Truffle Festival probably 15 years ago. Charlie knows everything there is to know about truffles in, in the um, Douglas fir forests of the West Coast. So he'd be a good man to talk to. Yeah, but, certainly. And then you've got the Chinese truffles, you know. The, the, I put a story in my book about how Chinese truffles arrived in Western Europe and had all sorts of undesirable impacts. But in fact, there are lots of different species of truffles that grow in China, and there are white truffles and there are black truffles, and they have... Again, different flavour profiles. I remember also, from your. Oh, sorry. Here's an interesting. Here's an interesting thing. This is a hobby horse of mine. But um, a long time ago, in, in when I was doing the research for that book, I went into the herbarium library at Kew Gardens. They were kind enough to let me in so that I could read all, everything they had in there on truffles. So this was probably I don't know early two thousands. Anyway, it turns out that the um, Chinese truffle which had such a big impact in the uh, truffle market in the 1990s, 
its its um, original scientific name was Tuba Indicum. Now, in, Indicum means from India. And it, it turns out that the type specimen came from um, a hill, uh, hill uh, uh, town um, outside Rishikesh. Now, Rishikesh is famous to those of us a certain age because it's where the Beatles went to spend um, time with uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. It's where they wrote most of the songs for the White Album. And I've always wanted to go to Rishikesh and sort of see where the Beatles wrote these fabulous songs. But I'm also <laughs> keen to go there to find out where these truffles are. Because the, mm. the, 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 the Chinese truffle is actually an Indian truffle. Why isn't India exporting tons of truffles? Whereas it's in, in um, Yunnan and Sichuan, where these truffles grow naturally in, in, in China, um, the presence of the truffles has completely revitalized the local economies. Um, wow. It's provided a, an income stream that wasn't there. It's, it's, it's given the, 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 the regions a reason to preserve their forests rather than chop them down because they yeah. can go out and they can harvest these things that strange Westerners are willing to pay you know, hundreds of dollars a kilo for. Um, so why is this happening in India? The, the truffles have still got to be there, you know. I say that one day, maybe when when we get through this bloody war with the virus, mm. um, maybe I can go to Rishikesh and do some exploration. Wow, that's very so interesting. <laughs> um, just want to wrap up here because you know I really appreciate your time, and I know we've run over a little bit. Um, but I'm always curious what books people read, and. I would love to know what one or two books um, have had a big impact on your life, whether they are mushroom related or otherwise. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I I read a lot, um, and I read kind of uh, literary fiction a fair bit, um, and I read science fiction. And I read a certain number of thrillers. Um, I do read nonfiction. Um, and there are a couple of non-fiction books which I think are very relevant to the discussion that we've had. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going away. Yeah, no, but, please grab it, yeah. Um, there are some books here that um, I think would, would be very useful for people who share our interests. Uh, one, the, one of them is fantastic. It's Peter Vorleben's book, The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, and it's about... Um, it's about the, the basically the, the the mycorrhizae. It's about the relationship between trees and fungi, and um, I don't know whether he invented the word the, the phrase or not, but um, the wood wide web. Mm. So basically, yeah. trees communicate through the fungal networks that grow on their roots. Um, they cooperate. They signal. Um, so that it, it's a really good read. Um, it was a big hit a few years back. Strongly recommend it. Um, if you're interested in truffles, um, Truffle Farming Today by my mate Carlos in Spain is the state of the art um, of where we are. Um, it, it's a couple of years old now, but um, if you're interested in, in growing truffles, very good on the background science of what, where we are today in, in our understanding of truffles. Um, probably the um, the Ultimate Truffle Book is Taming the Truffle by Ian Hall mm. and Gordon Brown and Alessandra Zambonelli. Um, Alessandra is a, a professore at um, the University of Bologna. I'm pleased to say she's a friend of mine as well now. Um, and if you, if you actually get the Taming the Truffle, the picture of the three of them in the back there is taken at Limestone Hills. <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, that's a recommendation. Brilliant. I mean, apart from that, um, I, I've always liked Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. Most people think Pynchon's really hard to read, but I thought Gravity's Rainbow was one of the funniest books I'd ever read. So that's a very non-truffle <laughs> recommendation for you. Yeah, it's all good, all good. I love, love it. Love to, love to learn all about that. Um, and any, any final comments or thoughts or suggestions? I think, I think the first, the first and most obvious thing is if you, if you're in the woods and you're foraging. Um, you do have to be 100% certain of, of, of what it is you're finding. And 
although I'm entirely self-taught, uh, I do see that there is huge value in going out with somebody who knows what they're doing. And with, with mushrooms in particular, there are guided forays that you can do in most parts of the world now. Um, you can do it in Christchurch with a friend of mine. Um, but you can go out on a guided foray and you'll be introduced to the key species. You'll be given a, you know, there's nothing like when you're, when you're foraging, actually seeing something mm. and, and comparing it. It wonderful though, Truffle, uh, the, the sort of mushroom guides and books are, I mentioned Roger Phillips before his book is absolutely fantastic. Um, the photographs are superb, but there is never anything like seeing it in the flesh. So if you really wanted to do this, I, I would suggest investing a bit of time and money and going out with people who know what they're doing. The other thing I think is possibly work out what your own obsessions are. Uh, you know, foraging is such a broad thing. It could be everything from making slow gin to scrumping apples to make your own cider to, um, you know, porcini to chanterelle to pied de mouton, all, all of those things. But try and work out what it is that really floats your boat and, and, and focus in on that and get really good at that. Um, and it takes time to do that. And it takes, because, because foraging is kind of an annual, you can only do it, you know, for each species once a year. Mm. Um, you kind of want to be able to focus really hard in the time when you when you can can get into that. Um, and if you miss a year, then you've got to wait another year. So it, it's worth. Not, don't try to be all things to all people. You know, try and find out. We were lucky in that we had the opportunity to set up our little farm, kind of following our noses, if you like. Um, we had we had an objective which was to, to to make some money to help us to retire and we've got we got there we could always do with making more money but um by by having made an investment of time and money that's there's nothing like having money on the line to make you focus in and 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 work out what it is you're doing so yeah I don't try to do too much too soon be sure of what you're doing but then make sure that you enjoy it too. Um, mm. You know, don't don't leave those porcini sitting in the bottom of the fridge for two days. You know, yeah, get out there and might do that again. Dry them, freeze them, eat them. <laughs> awesome. Well, th thank you very much. Um, and I just want to say, you know, thank you for all that you've done for the world of truffles and mushrooms. And uh, at least for me, like you know, a, a fantastic book, the truffle mm -hmm. book. Uh, really found it very inspiring and just just your um you know just the journey that you've done you know uk to the new zealand farm truffles winery you know it does it does sound very dreamy and um at the very least it's very very nice to to hear much more about your story and everything that went into it so um yeah thank you very much for being a guest on the show and uh if there's anything I can do for you in the future, then do let me know. I, I, I would love to have a part two because the whole time we were talking, I was just thinking of <laughs> other little rabbit holes and questions we could go off, but also trying to, trying to, uh, you know, keep, keep on the straight and narrow a little bit as well. But um, yeah, it's been no, good. No, look, uh, delighted, Ben. Uh, best of luck with the podcast. Um, if you want to come back to me at some point, yep. Yeah, always happy to talk. My wife says I could ball for New Zealand on the subject of travel. So always happy to talk. It's been fantastic. And um, yeah, I recommend people listening to go and buy the truffle book. And as far as I understand it, for people in the UK, they get this through James's website, englishtruffle.co.uk and yep. um, other places. Uh, Google it, I guess, or, yeah, or no, contact you directly. Yeah, we, um, <clears throat> you, can, you can, I think the, the Limestone Hills website um, book sales page is balked because PayPal changed the rules or something and I haven't okay. quite got around to fixing <laughs> it. But um, we can do you a PDF for five bucks, so that's um, not that's not a lot of money in, in English pounds, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sounds like a good deal. Anyway, thank you so much. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure. Okay, pleasure. Thanks, Ben.